Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was basically told what to say by Amanda, so it made my life a lot easier. <laughs> And she sort of said, you know, you've actually said, you know, because uh, Historic Environment Scotland was created in 2015. It's a new public body. And um, we have... Oh, what have I just done? I've turned into Mark Spanio. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. What button do I need to press? The just the, the arrow. Uh, ah, thank you. Sorry, I'm a non-Mac person. Um, that's who we are. I won't read it out for you. Um, it says we were set up in 2014. We're, that was the act. We were physically created in 2015. Um, we have a corporate plan. The corporate plan articulates both leadership and innovation in it very clearly. And as Amanda reminded me, we've stated that we intend to be a body that helps things happen and makes things happen, that embraces and prioritizes collaboration, conversation, openness, accessibility, and innovation. No pressure there then. And um, these are our values. You will see in there that innovative is one of our five values, which I think is why I was invited to speak. Um, but we do use innovation um, in a few places. And we have, obviously, we have a strong corporate plan. We have five strategic themes. And I'm just going to give you a few case studies of some of the things that we're doing that I think fit with this sort of idea of leadership and innovation um, and where they sit within those themes. If anyone's particularly interested, all this stuff is on our website, so it's very easy to find out more. Now, one of the things that I think we're playing a leadership role in is Scotland's Archaeology Strategy, which has been mentioned a couple of times today. There's some postcards out on seats. That's what it looks like. You can download it online. We've got an action plan. We've got partnerships across the sector. It's working well in some areas. It's not going so well in others, but there's an inevitability to that. We set it as a 10-year strategy so that we wouldn't be panicking after two years that it was a five-year strategy. Um, it's got five aims. You will see here that aim five is um, innovation and skills. Um, and that's being led by uh, CIFA because we've got partnerships leading on all of these. We also, I um, mean, somebody said, well, it's not about the money. We do put money into archaeology at Historic Environment Scotland. We have an archaeology program that puts £1.4 million pounds worth of grants. We cover a range of things. That's actually, it sounds like a lot of money. We're covering about, we're funding about 60 different projects and activities per year. So it actually gets spread quite thin. But I mean, the grants go from about £350 pounds to 100000 So it is quite a broad spread that we fund. Again, all the information is on our website. I mentioned aim five, you've got the objective here to ensure that people have the opportunity to acquire and use archaeological skills, and those skills provide the underpin underpinning for innovation in the understanding, interrogation, learning, and funding of archaeology. In that, we've been looking at training and targeting, which is targeted to fill specific strategic gaps, all aimed as sector partnerships Sometimes they've been led by universities and museums, and we try and get as many possible accredited by CIFA. Another example is our digital innovation team. We actually have somebody whose job title is Head of Digital Innovation and Learning. I nickname him Head of Toys and Cool Gadgets, because that's actually what he does. And um, we've actually got quite a lot of accessibility of our digital products, and they're developed in partnership with others at a team based in something called the Engine Shed in Stirling. If you haven't seen it, go and look at the website. It's the coolest shed in the world. It's official. Um, and it's not a men's shed. I will highlight that as well. And it opened in July 2017, and it's Scotland's first dedicated building conservation centre and serves as a central hub for building and conservation professionals and the general public. It aims to bring conservation to life and inspire a new generation to look after its heritage. There's a permanent exhibition there. There's an augmented reality map, uh, which reveals different layers of information. There's a whole range of interactive activities. It's also got an aud auditorium um, with 3D capabilities. And we've got various um, films and things that, that show that. And we've got quite a lot happening on that um, side of things. One of the other themes of our corporate plan is about understanding. And we've got a team on Aaron this week. And they're looking at scoping the future of large area archaeological recording using remote sensing data and the use of automated processing and targeted ground truthing. Now, Aaron's nickname is Scotland in miniature because it reflects the range of topography, geology, and land use on the island, which is on the west coast of Scotland. 
which makes it an ideal laboratory for testing approaches to rapid national mapping and other survey methods. There's also total coverage of half meter resolution ALS and a complete orthophoto coverage as well as a range of other sources. Now we've got LIDAR airborne laser scanning and these are sort of visualizations derived from that of shielding huts on Aaron to provide a multiplicity of ways of looking and supporting rapid large area survey without the requirement to cover all of the ground on foot. The Royal Commission as was, um, has been surveying Scotland for over 100 years and we still haven't finished, so we need to find faster ways of doing it. As somebody who worked in the Royal Commission for 19 years, I can say that. Um, we've got um, one of the most impressive discoveries this year was a new Cursus monument. It's two kilometers long, it's a short distance from Macri Moor, which is quite a well-surveyed and well-known area on the west coast of Arran, and it's only the fourth known such monument in Scotland that survives as an earthwork. Now, don't ask me the details of this, this is provided by a colleague, but automated object detection, which is convolutional neural networks, um, which is identifications over line on the LIDAR-derived visualisation for Macri Moor, shows good results of CNN detection for roundhouses, and also um, the challenges of morphologically very similar site types like sheeling huts and small cairns where there's a lot more noise. So sorry, that's what CNN is. It's not the American uh, thing. It's convolutional neural networks. Climate change, another area that's a very big one for us. Um, we need to understand the impacts of climate change and use that knowledge to manage and protect the properties and care that we run across Scotland, some of which lie in very vulnerable coastal locations. And here we've been working with um, SEPA in Scotland and the British um, Geological Survey as well. Um, sorry, I should know what SEPA stands for, but the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, I think. Now, um, sorry, so yes, Scottish Environment Protection Agency. The risk assessment developed a methodology and worked in partnership with these other organisations, and the information is being used for planning, for conservation, and research. Another project that we've run over the last year or so is called What's Your Heritage? Um, and this is all about revising our policy statement. Everything changed when we ceased to be, Historic Scotland ceased to be a government agency, we became a non departmental public body. We had to produce um, a replacement for what was known as SHET, Scottish Historic Environment Policy. So we have a policy statement. We now had a chance to be a bit more reflective. Um, and we thought, well, actually, let's start asking the public what they think about what we do. And that's what What's Your Heritage was. And we started asking people these things. And what did they think? What did they, what did they find important? We had over 2,000 survey responses. And uh, we realised that in all our years of history, we'd never actually asked the public what they thought about what we did when it came to designations. These are the survey results. Um, it was all fairly impressive. We've been told statistically that anything over 1,000 is a good statistical result. We've got guest blogs. Um, one of the best ones, a chap who runs the Loriston Bar, a well-loved pub. Just get someone talking about a pub and you're bound to get lots of hits on YouTube. Um, and that was actually the most engaged with content we've ever put online. And here is Mr. Clancy of Lauriston Bar, and this features on the cover of a whole load of our stuff, but it was really, really positive. It's a listed pub. So what does that mean? And what can we do? Well, you know, it's, uh, we can, you can see here, we, it's about increasing our public engagement, and it's actually thinking about where we're taking designations. What are we doing in the next step? And that's a reflective process that some of my colleagues are doing at the moment. What can we lead on? Well, the main thing was actually we decided we would go a change from a traditional consultation route and we asked people what they think first and then use that to shape policy and create a knowledge base that we didn't have before. And I'll finish on something Roman because most people who know me know I like to finish on something Roman. Um, the Antonine Wall is one of six World Heritage Sites in Scotland and we've been putting quite a lot of emphasis on it um, over the last couple of years. We've got various uh, projects um, partner funded and, and grant aided. And we've been looking at our educational offer for the Antonine Wall and um, creating a suite of digital and um, physical resources for education. And so here we have stuff that we've developed um, for 
primarily for schools. We've got four educational kits. We've developed them and we've loaned them, or we've, we've given them permanently to the Glasgow Museum's Resource Centre, and they are now loaning them out to schools across, um, across central Scotland who've got an interest in doing something Roman. Uh, we've also then combined that with digital resources. And we've got, um, we've got a game, we've got an app, we're developing the content for the app at the moment. Um, somebody was talking about gamification earlier. It's one of the things that we're exploring. It's trying to actually reach out to wide audiences. The next thing we're building is play parks. And I'm really excited about that. We've asked the kids in the local schools to design Roman themed play parks. And if we get the money from the HLF, there'll be five Roman themed play parks being built over the next um, year and a half. And boy, am I going to enjoy them with my kids. Thank you very much.